Yeah, so the first question is, it is so hard to find a biblical church these days with the correct gospel. What are your thoughts and experiences? Mm -hmm. Hmm. Is that who's going first? I'm sorry, I'm sorry. Um, I was fiddling around with my buttons there, but uh, uh, Renee, why don't you go ahead and go first? Have you found that to be the case in your experience? Yes, yes it's very upsetting. Um, I went to several churches while I was here. I've been to the big churches. Uh, I went to Pentecostal church. And, you know, every, I'm, not, I'm not saying that, that there's a lot of good people that seem to love Jesus in these churches. I'm not putting them down. But when it came to the gospel, I had to leave one because it was so liberal and no doctrine. It was just a bunch of fluff. You weren't getting fed on the word of God. It was just like a self-help sermon every week with a comedy sketch from the young pastor and no personal relationship with any of the actual people there. You know, it was just such a massive place. And then the, the other one was telling you how you could lose salvation. And so it took me two years. And the only denomination I could find was independent fundamental Baptist that still preached that salvation was truly by grace, simple grace. But then I found that even independent fundamental Baptists were straying from it in some places. And if a church called itself Baptist, you had to double check because it had been infiltrated by reformed theology and Calvinism. So all the Baptists were Calvinists. All of the independent fundamental Baptists, half of them had either turned towards the weird Andersonite hatred doctrines or had somehow been infiltrated by work salvation. So there's a very few. Now, my church stands on the true gospel. My pastor is very clear on that you cannot lose it. It's it's salvation. He's a very holy man. He lives for God. He preaches against sin and uh, living for Christ. But he's very clear on the gospel. I'm very uh, um uh, fortunate in that aspect, but it took me over two years and it just happened that he was building a church and we were meeting in a hotel for the first year and a half. So I waited until I could interview the pastor for an hour. I talked to him. I asked him all these questions. I said, I did not want to get involved with a church that I'd have to leave again because the gospel was wrong. And the reason it was so important to me, I cannot know if the Holy spirit is moving in that church. If I can't confirm, I know he's in the pastor. And so uh, I can't know it. it. I can't say they're not saved. I can't say they don't have the Holy Spirit if they're wrong on the gospel. I don't know. It's possible. But I do know if a pastor's preaching the right gospel and I can see the see how he's living and rule, and teaching people and he's appropriate, that I can I can be more certain that uh, God's, God's hand is on that church. So it took a long time. I uh, have, I still have issues. I don't agree with my pastor on everything. Like uh, there's certain things I don't agree with him on, but it's not important enough to, to leave, you know, forsake my church and not have a local fellowship. Um, so I understand how hard it is. Uh, there are some non-denominational churches that still have the free grace real gospel some of them some of them you gotta really look some of the bigger cities might have a couple i know that the grace evangelical society has a website that helps you locate a free grace church in every state however in most states there's only one or two of them that they have investigated that pass the test for a real gospel that's not being backloaded in some way or even front loaded for that matter. So it is a scary time, but you got to remember during the time when the Catholic church was uh, the ruler and that if you went against it, you were put to death. There were still remnants of people that knew the gospel. And I believe even when they were ruling and forcing people into these wrong doctrines, that there was a, there was a remnant within that church that were still believers and, and still rested in Christ. And ultimately, I think everybody at close to their death will just say, I, you know, I got to rely on God's mercy and grace. Um, but uh, it is very difficult. But if you look on the GES or the Grace Evangelical Society, you can type in your state and they can 
pick a couple of them in the state for you. Um, independent fundamental Baptist churches are usually a safe bet, but you've got to check their statement of faith. Um, just because it says grace community or grace this or Baptist, it doesn't mean they're right on the gospel. You really have to go and do a lot of work. It took a long time for me and it, it is, it is hard and it's very discouraging. It, it, it is true. You can usually find one though. It just takes a long time, a lot of work. Mm -hmm. Awesome. Well, I have a follow-up question for you on the, uh, on your follow-up time, Renee, about to explain what you meant by uh, backloading, because some people here probably don't know what that is. I mean, we have to remember that some of our viewers are advanced and some are novice uh, with this kind of uh, discussion and Bible study. So we'll ha have you explain that backloading in a, in a minute. But let's get Jordan. Have you had any success with local churches? Um, so this is actually something I've recently discovered. Um, I was born and raised in a Wesleyan church, which is a branch off Methodist, so very Arminian. Um, it was something I never saw as an issue until I returned to my hometown and I realized just how different my theology was. And I've had to make the tough decision to separate myself from that church. And it's very disheartening because my grandmother, who played a, she was a major vessel for the Lord in terms of my salvation. Um, it's only her hope and desire to see her entire family and the church pews every Sunday. So on a personal level, sometimes it's hard to distance yourself from that, but it's absolutely hard to find uh, churches with a biblical foundation. I have come to find out most recently that the church associated with the gospel is the Baptist church. I'm not sure, Luke would probably know more historically about this than I do. I don't know if that's because they weren't really a direct result of the Reformation. Um, it depends on which Baptist branch. Um, they kind of had, some of the Baptists had their own thing going before the Reformation through the Anabaptist movement. So I think since they weren't little children of the Roman Catholic Church, we don't see a lot of trickle down things like we see through the Lutheran and Episcopalians and even the Methodists. Um, I'm always willing to help people find a church in their area. I've done it for a few people and I'm actually helping someone in the congregation right now find a church in the area. And I wanna give you guys an idea. I have an email pulled up here. When I'm emailing someone on behalf of the person that I'm seeking a church for, here's some of the questions that I've asked them. So maybe you guys can watch this back, or if you have a notepad or anything, you can take them down in the event that you reach out to any churches. So the first thing I always ask them is what Bible version do they use? Um, a lot of people in this chat are KJV only, but if they're using primarily something like NIV, NLT, um, NS NSRV, things like that, just avoid that church together because you're going to hear a lot of false doctrine. And then within the Baptist community, um, the one question I or one of the questions I will ask is if they are dispensationalist. If you're not quite sure what dispensationalism is, I feel that that topic is going to come up Wednesday if we get to the Bible verse in Colossians that talks about dispense. If not, we are definitely going to be talking about it Friday. It's one of our true false statements. So we'll elaborate later at that time. But um, that's one of the questions that I would ask. And then I would ask if they are Reformed Baptists. If you are seeing that word Reformed, that means they are Calvinists, which means the assurance of their salvation. And Renee's going to explain this in a moment to answer uh, Brother Luke's question. But Calvinists have assurance of salvation in their works and not the cross. Um, I've noticed that their church discipline is very questionable. Um, primarily, if you know who James White is, he has some very questionable um, church discipline where he will actually prohibit people from partaking in the Lord's Supper 
that is another question I would ask is how frequently do they partake in the Lord's Supper? I think that is something we should um, partake in weekly. And I feel the church has lost its reverence for its importance. Um, and then the other sacrament that you should ask about is what would all go into water baptism as far as how it's being handled, especially during these very trying times. If you do, if you haven't been baptized or you choose to be rebaptized under the Baptist church. Um, and then some other important questions to ask are, well, of course you want to know their stance on eternal security and imputed righteousness. That should be a yes to both that they should believe in. And then what opportunities do you currently have available for whatever age range you are in, whatever gender you want to know how, what, um networking and fellowship opportunities they have um and then does the church ever do any missionary trips even if you're not somebody who wants to go on a missionary trip i always feel that it's important to be involved with a church who supports missions okay thank you brother it was a really i'm sure we can all recognize you put a lot of thought into that um interesting uh positions that you hold on that. Um, well, I'll speak on my own experience uh, with local churches. Um, when I first got saved back in December of 1986, uh, a close friend of mine had also been saved recently and he was going to a church. So I, he invited me, I, I went and thank you, Jesus. Uh, it turns out that the very first church I went to uh, uh, had uh, the right gospel, and uh, I, I personally, I just felt so comfortable there. I, I became very close to the pastor uh, and felt like he was um, discipling me. And uh, then after probably a year there, um, the board of directors fired the pastor, and there were no grounds. He hadn't done anything wrong. They just had someone else that they wanted to bring in instead. And it was, it was. I just saw the the politics, and it was shocked me, and it was so unfair. I I left uh, in protest, and of course I tried to find another church. And I think it's uh, C.S. Lewis's book, Mere Christianity, uh, one of his most popular, uh, famous books. Um, I think he talks about. Uh, uh, becoming a taster of churches. And that's the period I went through where uh, Las Vegas, when I was born here, we, we were small, about 20,000 people. We've got about 2 million people here now. So there's a lot of churches. Matter of fact, we used to brag that in Las Vegas, we have more churches per capita than any city in, in America. I don't know if that's true today or not, but there's a lot of churches here of all kinds. Uh, it was Las Vegas was established and originally as a railroad stop and a Mormon um, uh, establishment. I forgot what you call it. The Mormon. Uh, uh, they 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 were the founders of Las Vegas, so the Mormon religion is has, was very prominent in Las Vegas too. But I went to a lot of different churches, uh, and it, it was good in a lot of ways, and because I got to experience each one and find out what each one of them would believe and, and how yeah, how comfortable or uncomfortable I was in each one of them. <clears throat> and some of them, a couple of them, I, uh, I was there for quite a while. And uh, eventually though, there's, I discovered one thing or another that bothered me. My wife started being concerned that maybe I was the problem that, uh, you know, you, you can't find a church that you're happy with. Maybe you need to be uh, less, uh, you know, demanding, uh, but, there is a reason that we have, they say, uh, if you Google this, I think you'll find that it says there's over 30,000 denominations of Christianity. And uh, what happened from the beginning of the church in the, in the book of Acts, we know that there was basically two. One was the Judaized version where they thought it was faith in Jesus and practice in Judaism. And then the, the, the true church was no, you got to leave Judaism out of it. This is not a religion. This is a, a trusting Jesus entirely. So it's faith alone in Christ alone that Paul was championing. 
So th that was the first ob obvious uh, distinction. And th then after that, each group, it seems, reaches a point where, uh, and it's CES, we've had at least two times now where we've had a faction decide they got to go their a separate way because they disagree on something and they can't tolerate it. So they have to go and uh, find another church or form their own group. And so now we have this is done over and over again, and there's 30,000 denominations. Um, uh, that's why this principle I talked about in the beginning, unity, liberty, charity, I believe is the right um, answer. Um, in fact, uh, when we started this, uh, I, I, I was calling it an experiment. And I said, this is an experiment, but it's doomed to fail. At some point, uh, it'll, it won't work. Uh, because of my experience seeing how eventually people disagree and divide. Uh, but then we, we came to the conclusion that it was not an experiment any longer. It was a blueprint. A, a CES, I believe, is a model now for others to, to copy and duplicate. I, I really believe that. Um, and that is that we're not going to be dogmatic about a hundred things or even a dozen things. We're going to be dogmatic on three things. And everything else we have liberty and by doing that we we should be able willing to hear each other out on all other doctrinal questions and learn from each other and compare notes and in iron sharpens iron um so i believe that if we did that we wouldn't there's no reason for us to divide because we're giving freedom to disagree on all everything except these three dogmas um but that's not the case uh, but getting back to the local churches um I found that uh, eventually uh, I, I had a home Bible study and it grew and eventually everybody said, this is our church. And so it's same kind of thing that happened here with CES, uh, a, a small group of people having getting together to study and discuss the Bible. Eventually people thought it's their church. And uh, so I had a church in my home for seven years. Um, but just like everything else, eventually there people divide because you find something that um people are just intolerant and then they, they have to part company and it seems inevitable um but uh, that's been my experience but i'd say if if you can find a good local church and you may not be able to but uh what you need is you need a church that i believe is, is like what we've established here in that they have the core doctrines correct and they're not going to be dogmatic on a hundred other things and uh, as far as all the other things, um, I guess it will, part of that will um, be a question of your personal taste. How, how comfortable do you want a certain kind of music? You want a certain style of preaching? Uh, you know, you'll, you'll find out which ones uh, are appealing to you and which ones aren't. The last church I went to locally was a Calvary Chapel church that uh, it was pretty good overall, except it seemed dead. I've, I, talked to the pastor after service one day and I said, it seems like the church is dead. And he, he was offended and defended the church. Uh, I said, I, I, I feel like I want to shout out, amen, or that's right, or like stand up and clap. I mean, I, you, you're, you're doing a great job preaching, but I know that, that is, that's not part of the way the conduct is here uh, and that it would be frowned upon. And I'd probably be asked to restrain, refrain from that. And uh, so I, I, I like a, a church that is not so charismatic that they're rolling in, in the aisles, but uh, uh, but not so rigid that you have to just sit on your hands. That's just the, the personality of the church that I prefer. Um, okay, let's uh, let's do a follow up on the same question. But Renee, could you elaborate a little bit more about for those people who don't know what you meant, maybe by um, backloading works? Yeah. Uh, well. Most churches have uh, corrupted the gospel in that they have changed the word repent to add a work. Um, they say that repent means to um, be willing to or to stop sinning. So you're turning away from sinning and living for the Lord. Well, in, in some sense, I mean, that's kind of a kind of happens when you're translated from the kingdom of darkness to the kingdom of light. But that's not what repent means. Uh, repentance for salvation is to go from unbelief or idolatry or work salvation or uh, whatever it is you're trusting in to turning to Christ in faith. 
and resting in what he's done on Calvary, believing the message of him uh, on the cross. And so there's ways that they do things like that, uh, that to add something you've got to do for you to be saved. Now, backloading is when they claim, oh, it's it's free. It's a free gift. It's grace through faith. But if you don't uh, see a bunch of change in your life or you haven't, uh, you're still uh, living in sin. Well, you didn't really get saved. So now your your actual um, uh, you know proof of your salvation is you and your works and how good you are. So what you're going to do uh, is strive in your flesh to overcome this, so you can prove to yourself that you're you're either one of the elect that's chosen by God. Uh, or that you're really saved because look, I used to do this and now I do that, right? That's backloading because it's still giving you your foundation that's you. Your foundation and the reason you have security to know where you're going is because of the bloodshed for you on Calvary. He paid your sin debt and he died once for all. So it's past, present, future because he's not going to die again at the end of your life to cover everything. It goes both directions. So what they'll do is they'll limit his atonement somehow, or they'll make you put your faith in what you do or evidence they see in your behavior to determine whether you've really got converted or not. But the promises of God and the finished work of Christ is where we get our security. So that's what I mean when I say backloading. They'll they'll make it still about you somehow. Okay, thank you. All right, Brother Jordan, would you any more you want to say about this question? Yeah, I will actually um piggyback off that, but go to the opposite extreme um with the people who you will go to. And um these are what I don't even know, hyper grace, I guess is the best word we can come up with them. Um, it's important to find a pastor, congregation, church leadership that will lead you down the correct path of salvation. If you're going to them and asking, how can I be saved? And they say, well, repeat after me, say this prayer. And then they write your date in the back of your Bible and say, now that's the date you were saved. Or if they are like, well, just ask Jesus in your heart. Or they'll ask questions. Did you profess him as faith? Do you believe in the life, death, burial, resurrection of Jesus Christ? But you'll see a lot of these things like, why do you have to worry? You're worrying for a reason. So if a pastor is not taking that time to dive deep to see what that worry is, um, you could be saved and you could just be confused. You might not be saved because you just haven't heard the right gospel. And that is to trust fully in the life, death, burial, and resurrection as the full atonement for um, your sins. Now, you should find a pastor that if they feel that you are unsaved or you they do not understand the full God or you do not understand the full gospel, that pastor should be willing to stay up all night with you to make sure that you fully understand the gospel. So if you're looking, if these pastors are kind of just shrugging it off or it's not a big deal, that's not really a good teacher to um, be attending their church, in my opinion. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> okay, very good. Interesting point. Uh, <clears throat> yeah, we we did have uh, uh, an issue that took a long time for us to resolve, uh, and that is what about when someone has doubt? And if a person has any doubts or fears or worries about their salvation, is it is an indication that there is a problem because. Uh, I believe the gospel is the blessed assurance. It is the eternal security. It, it, if a person doesn't understand and believe that I'm saved, nothing could ever change it uh, because Jesus promised it. And that's as good as gold. And uh, um, then they, they didn't really comprehend really what the gospel is. It's the good news that you're going to go to heaven because Jesus pro accomplished it and promised it to you. And uh so if a person is unsure about their salvation or they're worrying about it, then, then it's an indication that, well, did they ever really understand it correctly? Because if you understood it correctly, you should know that it's settled. Nothing you can do can ever change it. And you don't have to do anything to prove it to others. 
uh, and because you know Jesus, uh, Jesus's promise is all that you need to really get is that he says he's he's finished everything that's necessary, and uh, just trust him for it. <clears throat> so uh, yeah, it is uh, something that uh, needs to be uh, understood. Uh, okay, Renee, any more on any of this before we go to the next question? Well, just don't just don't uh, make your standards ridiculous. Like you're not going to find a perfect church. And if it was perfect, like my pastor says, once you get there, it won't be perfect anymore because we're all messed up. So let's just find something that's important to you. And for me, it's the gospel. The gospel's got to be right because everything stems out from there. If that's not right, I can't be sure. I can't be uh, certain about the pastor or any of it. So, um, uh, and we support missionaries overseas for the gospel. So that's important. Um, you may have different standards, but uh, don't, you know, I like, I know I won't find a church that I, that I agree with on everything. So I still do go because I think we should be part of a local community to support it. And so that they could support us as well. Uh, that's why I choose a smaller church now where the pastor, you know, when someone passes away, he shows up at my house an hour later, you know, so that you actually have a relationship with uh, the small community there. But everybody has different uh, needs. Um, you'll, If you're trying to find things, everything to fit you perfectly, uh, it's not it's not going to work. So uh, figure out what the most important thing is. For me, it's the gospel. It should be for you, too. Um, and once you find it, you know, um, get involved because it, it is important to support our local fellowships as well. But if you cannot get to one, uh, we are trying our best to make something available so that you're not in the solitude in this time right now. Yeah, well, I, uh, I guess you, you both mentioned what's most important to you. <clears throat> and uh, <clears throat> so I'll tell you what I think. Uh, foundation and that is the gospel uh, they got to have the right gospel and they should have a desire to share the gospel uh, the first i told you the first church that i joined uh um it was really ideal they even had a course that i took called evangelism explosion uh, the course was uh, constructed by d james kennedy and uh uh the the formula that uh, the the methodology to present the gospel what we call the diagnostic question. Are you certain you're going to go to heaven? And if so, why? The, this premise is how I learned it from that course. And then they uh, allowed me to take the, the people who were uh, said they wanted more information when they came to visit the church. They wanted more information than I, I could call on them and present the gospel. Um, and then the uh, eventually uh, I went into street preaching and uh, that kind of evangelism. But to me, evangelism is what's the most important thing because um, you can do uh, all kinds of good things through the church. But uh, if you haven't uh, uh, given them the gospel and, and uh, led them to this saving faith, then um, everything else is, is um, really meaningless because it's just temporary. Feed, clothing people, feeding them, and visiting them in prison, all these things, yes, but uh, what about eternity? What, what is their standing? And so the first and foremost, uh, you, really, every the church and I think all believers, our, our top priority is this gospel and getting it right and sharing it. 